Hi everyone, I'm here with Michael. And Michael, actually I know Michael for many a years. He also comes to our TMA meeting here with the pastors. And we're taking the opportunity while he's here just to catch up with Michael and get some of his heart and passion onto, onto your day and bless your day with it. Michael, tell us a little bit about you because they probably don't know Michael, but Michael is here in Toowoomba at... Redeemer Evangelical Lutheran Church in Neal Street. Yay, right in the heart of town. Been here for five years. Yeah. How was it when you first started coming up here to Toowoomba, your place? Well, cool. I know this area a little bit because my first call was to Oki and Norwin when I graduated. Um, that's nearly 20 years ago yeah. that I, I, I went to Oki and Norwin. So I knew the area a little bit, left the area for about a decade. And then got called back to Toowoomba. Yeah. Um, so we liked the area, good place to raise kids, yeah. good place to live. Um, but yeah, very different ministry here from what I had in Oki and Norwin. Yeah. <laughs> what I love about Michael, every time I speak to him, and it, it, it you'll see it, it's on his face written all over. But um, Michael has a passion for teaching in faraway places. And I think that goes all the way back to your roots because you actually were born and raised in PNG, wasn't it? That's right. So both my parents were missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. Actually, my mum was up there before my dad. She went there as a teacher, uh, teaching in a Lutheran school, Asaroka Lutheran High School. And then after two years, she thought she was going to come back to Australia, and that was done with PNG. But then she married my dad, and he got sent up there as a pastor. <laughs> and they spent another 15 years or so in PNG. Yeah. So she wouldn't have complained going back there, hey? No, she was happy enough to go. <laughs> so what was it like being raised as a missionary kid and in a faraway place, and knowing that this is a place that um, is not home, they're obviously there to serve. Did that ever come across to you that, you know, you're here in a strange place? But you obviously made it home because that's the way you were raised. Look, looking back, I'd say being raised in PNG was a very privileged life. Um, I, I, I have good memories of it. Yeah. And um, um, I, at the time, I thought it was boring, though. Because we always knew that eventually we'd come back to Australia. And I thought that was more exciting and, um, than life in PNG. But... Uh, although PNG, you'd have moments of intense excitement, <laughs> you know, get held up on the highway or something. Those excitements, yeah. okay. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, we never actually got stopped, but there was, uh, I, I do remember them trying to stop us and driving through a roadblock and, <laughs> and getting away. And so there were moments of intense excitement. But um, one thing I think I... I carried with me ever since is uh, a love for cross-cultural relationships. Yeah. So the school I went to in Papua New Guinea um, had just over 200 kids and one year we counted up 47 different nationalities. Wow. And so as a kid, you just learn to be colorblind. You know, people are just people. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what color their skin is or anything like that. And you learn to make cultural adjustments and to not assume all, all sorts of cultural things that we assume when we just live in the monoculture. And, and so you listen to people and you find out where they're coming from culturally. Um, and I think psychologists, they talk about third culture kids. So third culture kids are people like me who grew up in a situation where the culture in which they're living is not their culture, but the culture of their parents' homeland is not their culture either. Yeah. You know, so you kind of fit into a third culture. Yeah. yeah. And uh, one characteristic of third culture kids is they tend to fit in everywhere and nowhere. I share a little bit of that uh, sentiment because i mean growing up in germany although it's still very much a western culture coming yeah. into australia so it hasn't been that uh, that different language and other things uh, have become very obvious but do you know the interesting thing is about not being able to fit in one or the other and you you kind of like have a foot in both but you don't really belong in yeah. either and with that was um, i remember when i was in the seminary and joe came back from png and one of the things that I remember that he was sharing is how much of the gospel is actually cultural. 
and it really dawned on me about, you know, being here and being over there. And it's the same kind of church, if you like, but the cultural trappings yeah. of it are so vastly different. Yeah. Have you noticed that yourself? When Because Michael's actually been traveling all over the different world and especially um, Asian area yeah. and teaching. Now, Asian areas are probably uh, a lot more different, but have you noticed that, you know, when we're talking about the culture of the gospel, that we actually mm -hmm. have a very Western mindset of what that is and we have to dismantle that to get to the real gospel? Well, I think more than, more so than having a cultural view of the gospel is we've got all these cultural blinkers which yeah. means there are certain things in god's word or in the gospel that we recognize but there are other things that we're blind to and there are all sorts of things in our culture that we're blind to so we're we're actually we're actually thinking in a western cultural mindset but we think it's a christian mindset yeah and they're not always, <laughs> always the same thing and so not only did i grow up in png i also lived in the united states for eight years on yeah. three different occasions but added all up it was eight years and I, as you said, I've done a lot of tr teaching trips overseas. And one thing that does is it enables you to see your own culture from the outside. Mm -hmm. And you see all kinds of things that people living in the culture just take for granted and don't even think about. And so it enables you to critique your own culture, which is kind of disconcerting because... I find that I tend to be a contrarian thinker on almost everything. And it's not deliberately. It's not, not that I'm um, you know, trying to set myself apart from other people. It's just that I can't go along with the herd mentality because I, I've learned to step outside the herd. And so I see it differently. And yeah, yeah so, yeah. Uh, but yeah. So for someone listening in, and thinking, hey, I've done Christianity always like this. How much of that has been the gospel and how much of that has actually been herd mentality? And especially when you kind of step out, what would you say? It was like, you know, um, take a step out of your, what you know about, this is the way you were raised, but look for the gospel without the herd mentality. How, how did that happen for you? How, how do you take the blinkers off so that you can see a, a bigger picture of the gospel? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't know that there's a simple recipe, but um, I'll share a story. So uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I invited a friend of mine from Toowoomba to come with me on a teaching trip to Nepal. And this is the guy who was raised in the Lutheran church from infancy, um, been a Christian his whole life. But I think... For a long time, he'd been kind of going through the motions of, you know, kind of a cultural Christianity. Now, he'd already been on a journey for some time where this was starting to become a lot more real and meaningful to him. Uh, but when, when we got to Nepal, um, that got put into hyperdrive, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> of yeah. Um, just seeing a totally different view of the church where Western culture just, in a sense, was all, all stripped away. Yeah. And you've got people in uh, very difficult circumstances, often extreme poverty, but also persecution, and, and just seeing the way that, say, their prayer life was just all important to them. You know, like in a, in a Western culture, and we don't even think about it, we're so used to relying on our human strength because i think that's one of the fundamental assumptions of western society is that there must be a human solution to every problem and so we face a problem what do we do well we hold a meeting and even in the church we'll hold a meeting we'll pray for two minutes and then we'll plan and strategize for three hours which tells you that our faith is in the planning and the strategizing not in the god who hears and answers prayers now, we would never articulate that. No. It's just, it's just the way we operate. Yeah. And it's, actually, it's a cultural way of operating. You go to Nepal and they face a problem and they all come together and pray. And they pray and pray and sometimes they pray all night. You know? And at some point they might get around to saying, hey, you know, maybe 
let's talk about what we could what do our that. plans are and what we could do. But the whole focus is actually on the God who hears and answers prayer, not on our planning and strategizing. I have found from the stories of many who've actually had their eyes open by going into mission fields that, uh, and this would be a really good kind of like um, a thought for today, everyone else sort of um, hearing this, is that this story is actually the same story that they have heard again and again, is that God really puts it down onto prayer and strips away all these other things and then says, this is the be all and end all. Everything comes from here. Yeah. They've rediscovered prayer. Maybe that's a that's a blessing for everyone here is that, yeah. you know, um, don't be a culturally yeah. defined Christian. Be yeah, a yeah, prayer yeah. defined Christian. Yeah. yeah. Now, just finish the story. My friend, he actually came back from Nepal and he was so moved by what he saw there with the Christians. He quit his job and now works full time in mission. So, <laughs> you know, but, so you never but, know what happens. <laughs> but I think, I think another thing is... Um, in terms of the gospel, we have all these kind of cultural assumptions about what the Christian life should look like. Yeah. You know, the way you dress, the way you sing, the way you, you know, um, the way the church operates. And most of that's, well, a lot of that's culturally defined. Actually, it's not necessarily biblically defined. Biblically, there could be many ways to yeah. do it. And we often fight, end up fighting about cultural things. So... In, in Australia, at least in the Lutheran Church of Australia, for a long time, we had we, we had these kind of worship wars, and it's fighting over whether you whether you wear a gown or whether you don't wear a gown, whether you use an organ or whether you use a guitar, and and it's actually it was actually a cultural war. Yeah. Now there were spiritual issues underlying that, and the spiritual issues were real and important, but that often wasn't what people were focusing on. They were focusing on all of these external cultural things. Um, so getting people to actually refocus on the word of God and refocus on the wonderful good news is just so tremendously liberating. And refreshing. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so yeah. often we end up judging each other based on all of these cultural things yeah. rather than actually saying, well, what does the word of God really say? <laughs> And you know, situation. that might actually be a really good sort of uh, thing for everyone listening today. Get into the Word of God and actually discover what is it really saying. Without the cultural trappings, what is God's Word saying to us? Yeah. I want to say thank you, Michael, for sharing with us today. This might actually just be part one, hey, because there's so much more yet to yeah. come. So <laughs> we might do a part two. But look, say bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>